New launches from some particular car makers definitely get a lot more attention than others in our car market. Well, you already know that, and so certainly it gets our attention too. We've got the all-new Mahindra Verito vibe. So when the manufacturer in question is Mahindra and Mahindra, we certainly set up and take notice. We've got all the details coming your way on this sub-4 meter Verito from Mahindra. Welcome to CNB. I'm Siddharth and I, Patankar. Let's get started. When Mr. Chidambaram decided to allow cars below a certain length and below a certain engine capacity to gain a tax benefit all those years ago, he was probably only thinking of the humble small car, the hatch. What we got instead was ingenuity. Tata Motors started it by sub-4-metering the Indigo, then the market leader threw us the second-generation Swift Desire, Honda followed with its Amaze, and we were the ones to first tell you about plans from Mahindra and Volkswagen to chop up the Verito and the Vento respectively. Mahindra is ready and the Verito vibe is out of the gate. Now remember, before the Mahindra-Renault alliance broke up, we did expect the Sandero, the hatch based on this platform, to make an appearance. Once the divorce did happen, Mahindra was free to do whatever it wanted with the Logan, but it didn't have access to any generation changes or the other body styles like the Sandero hatch or the Step MPV. Do you remember the Princess Diaries where Anne Hathaway starts the movie looking like a very geeky, awkward teenager and then by the end, she's transformed into this beautiful princess. Well, it doesn't always work out like that in real life, but uh, that's pretty much the kind of challenge Mahindra had when it first got its hands on the Logan, right? A very plain Jane looking car. And last year, when the final iteration was complete, not just the initial tweaking, but the final new look Verito came to the market, I did tell you that I thought they'd done a pretty smart job. What they'd managed to do with the front grille, a little Kia-like, worked for the car, it made it look a little bit more contemporary. But you can't really do too much else because, you know, the angles and the sharp lines everywhere else on the body, well, you can't really change that around. The advantage is that uh, the market is flooded with all sorts of rounded, fluidic designs, and so, which is why this does stand out. The work that's been done on the Vibe in particular, darkening that front grille into a sort of a graphite gray, I think works. It makes the car look a little bit less boxy up front and uh, looks pretty attractive. It's been complemented by smoking out the headlights a little bit. Again, a little gimmicky, but still manages to work. Now, the part where Mahindra starts to air a little bit. You've got these nice ideas, you get lots of them, and you put them all together. It doesn't always work, because you've got wheels here that have been finished off in what they're calling a champagne color. I'm not sure that complements that. I would have liked to have seen perhaps graphite gray alloys. It would have looked really smart, very distinct and different. At the rear, of course, is where the big plastic surgery has happened. And uh, you know what? When you look at the car, it looks like a nice big hatch. And uh, that's a good thing because the lines, the overall feel is congruous. It doesn't look like it's been abruptly chopped off. It looks like it was meant to be this way. Of course, when you look at the overall profile of the car, you've got to think that maybe that's not too contemporary. But you know what? You've got other cars like the Figo as well, which aren't necessarily contemporary, but the styling works. The taillight treatment has been done really nicely. I think full marks to uh, the Mahindra designers on that. The fact that it's been raised from the uh, windscreen is again smart because it gives a uh, reason, if you will, for bringing some of this roof rail styling into the taillight cluster and then meeting the little bulge of the boot at the back. So that part works again. The boot itself, uh, you know, they've given it a little bit of a lip here, a little, well, you can't really call it a spoiler, but again, that works because it gives a sense of space. And remember, all along, it looks like a hatch. That's the only letdown, if you will, because had this been a big hatch door, I think you would have got a lot more space on the inside, but re-engineering that costs a lot more than what this has been, uh, than what's been done here. And so I think in that sense, the compromise still works. I am glad that uh, the car is still called Verito and you know, it doesn't have a totally different name. The vibe suffix is very typical of the Indian market. You do see a name being added onto the car and it's better than what some of you suggested, Vibo. I'm very glad that didn't happen. And uh, you know what, talking about all those different colors, again, too much chrome here at the back, maybe too much like the sedan as well. It could have been a little distinct by, again, giving that graphite sportier sort of an image back here. And uh, that has been carried out in the bumper where you do see this two-tone. And uh, while I think that's a smart move, it makes the rear look a little less heavy as well by adding the black element. It also shows up some of the cheap plastic. So I'm not sure drawing attention to that was such a smart idea. But on the whole, I think uh, this whole effort of bringing the Verito to a sub-4-meter sort of a level 
from a design point of view, seems to work. Now, hang on, Sid. If all the fuss is about that rear end, when are you going to show us the boot? Isn't that right, folks, huh? On the regular Verito, the boot is a big USP in that car. 510 liters is the volume of the uh, Verito's boot. So does that get severely compromised? It's a question, obviously, that buyers will ask because in this particular space, even if you look at the premium hatches, well, let's start off by comparing to uh, the inevitable Maruti Suzuki Swift. That's 232 liters. Then you've got the uh, i20, nice big boot, 295 liters. And then you've got the Ford Figo, 284 liters. So, is this then a compromise? Well, first up, let me show you what it looks like. Now, that's the inconvenient part. The fact that you have to go in there to release the boot. There isn't a little catch here. You can't do it from the keyless entry fob. You've got to do it from inside, and that's inconvenient because when you're carrying stuff, you don't really want to have to do that. Now, take a look at that. 330 liters, nice and ample and uh, fairly generous, at least on paper. The only downside is that, of course, access to it is not as convenient as a regular hatch or even a regular boot because, you know, you've got to sort of reach in there. So when you're putting out a big, heavy bag, that could be a little bit inconvenient. But otherwise, of course, in terms of space, and especially for your daily needs, you don't carry heavy bags every day. Well, for that, it is definitely ample. Okay, so it's spacious but not very convenient. The boot, though, is really compromised only so you can get a huge pricing incentive. The Vibe is priced attractively, but it isn't a steal. There are three variants and the top end is actually reasonably well loaded. But compare it to cars like the Ford Figo and the Vibe will seem pricey. The Figo starts at 4 lakh 89,000 rupees and goes up to 6 lakh rupees ex showroom, while the Swift and the Ritz from Maruti are in the same territory. And just like the Figo looks like a better deal with its space and specs over the Maruti models, the Vibe should have too, but it doesn't. Of course, since the Vibe isn't a hatch, you may want to draw comparisons with the Desire and a Maze 2, in which case prices look pretty good. Mahindra has chosen to go with just the 1.5 diesel and not the 1.4 petrol option on the Vibe. This may have been a master stroke a few months ago, but we think a lower entry price would have been more judicious in the current market. The unit is hardly responsive and the numbers very ample, right? Now, just like the uh, Verito and of course the Logan before it, engine noise and uh, the AC fan noise are a little bit of an issue. But outside of that, it's very much that European car that, uh, you know, the Logan always was. And that's what works in its favor in many ways because you get that nice solid feel from the suspension. Handling is pretty good too. And uh, overall, the car doesn't feel at all compromised or toy-like or very light. All of those attributes are very much there on the Vibe as well, despite the fact that the car is a little bit shorter at the rear. There is a touch of lag, but barring that and the almost too much of room, the car performs well. In our opinion, the Vibe may have benefited from slightly fatter tyres for sportier handling and ride, but fuel efficiency dictates the 185 by 70 R14 tyre size. The claim mileage, by the way, is 20.8 kilometres per litre. Mahindra has played it smart with the Verito and the Verito Vibe. The question is, can it make the transition from being seen as uncool to being slightly more upmarket in urban? We will be watching the sales closely. The big rivals for the car are the Figo and the Swift, and not really the Desire or the Amaze in our view. Is this finally the true hot hatch that we've been waiting for, especially from a brand like Volkswagen, which holds the hot hatch flag up high globally with cars like the Golf and yes, the Polo too. Well, the Polo 1.6 did come and go, but this 1.2 TSI powered GT is looking more interesting. The thing is that when you think hot hatch, you pretty much want it all. And yes, performance is right on top of that all list. Of course, this 1.2 TSI is a gem. And when 
the Polo was first brought to India, I remember making this point that expensive or not, that's the engine it should have come in with. Of course, for cost reasons and for price tag reasons, we got the three-cylinder 1.2, but better late than never because uh, my very first review of the Polo that was done in Europe with the car at the global launch was on this very combination, 1.2 TSI, DSG gearbox. So of course, what you do get now is the seven-speed DSG. And that's the real story because you don't really pick up on the refinement of the engine as much as you do on the gearbox. Downshifts, especially from third to second though, can be just a little bit clumsy. Otherwise, all's good. Oh yes, indeed. The GT TSI is fast. It's reasonably furious and it definitely responds well. The suspension could have had a harder, sportier feel though and seems to have been softened up a bit much for Indian conditions. But handling is superb and the steering very precise. The DSG gearbox is effortless for the most part as I said and shifts are mostly imperceptible. The figures now and you can see why that turbo stratified injection or TSI engine is so worthy of its popularity globally. VW has honed its dual clutch DSG gearbox technology but yes we are worried about its durability in dusty and hot India and also its maintenance, repair and replacement costs. I would have also liked to see paddle shifters and not just the tiptronic option on the gear lever. Outside of that, this makes for a great, powerful package indeed. After all, most diesel and petrol hatches are in the 70 bhp territory, so this is nice and high. This new Polo is definitely a welcome addition to our market and finally quenches the thirst for such a combination. Advanced and exciting automatic gearbox paired to a reasonably meaty engine. The price tag is steep at 7,99,000 rupees ex-showroom Delhi and that's when the excitement starts to fizzle out. Yes, this technology wouldn't come cheap and we know that. But at that price, the typical Indian buyer would say, I may as well buy a sedan like the city or Vento, right? And then there's the styling or lack of it. The car doesn't immediately look any different than the regular Polo. It is sadly only available in red, white and black, so no special colours and doesn't have any embellishments besides the TSI and GT badges at the rear and a very tacky looking sticker on the C-pillar to indicate that it's a souped up and different ride. It does have the updated blacked out headlights and I have to say the GT badge on the front grille is pretty sexy. Here's the thing, VW India would have had it uh, a little bit difficult in terms of how to position this car. On the one hand, you're offering something very different, very new, very exciting. And on the other hand, you're constrained because, you know, you can't make this car cheap. You do have a TSI engine in there. You do have a DSG gearbox. So how do you make it more enticing? Well, to the Indian consumer, just those goodies aren't good enough. So uh, I would have liked to have seen a car that costs more than 8 lakh rupees on road to throw in a little bit extra, you know, I don't want to feel shortchanged saying that, hey, hang on, equipment wise, my car doesn't look very much different from the top end Polo that already exists in the market. So maybe a different music system, though it's nice to see the USB interface coming in here now. Maybe a fancier climate control, though it's difficult to change in dash things here. So why not then throw in leather seats, maybe just a few extras that uh, make it seem worthwhile spending this kind of money so that when you get into the car, you get a feeling of luxurious plushness, which currently is lacking. The car does have some goodies loaded in though, like a hill hold function, fog lights, ABS, 15 inch alloys, leather on the steering and gear knob, and dual front airbags. All of this standard. Now VW claims mileage of more than 17 kilometers to the liter, but I reckon that you'd get a more realistic 13 km PL on this car. Now it's too bad that fast attempts from Fiat with the Punto and even Volkswagen with the 1.6 Polo haven't really worked. But there is a small but growing breed of buyers who want hatch practicality with superior performance and also the convenience of a modern automatic gearbox. Yes, I did say that's a small number. And so for the sake of the market, and for those buyers too. I hope that we get to see the GT on our roads. Now word is that VW is also preparing a diesel GT 
with a DSG gearbox. Now wouldn't that also be lovely? So are you feeling the vibe? Well, Mahindra would like to know for sure. And in the meanwhile, tell me what you think about it as well. Let's slip into a short break here. Our sector snapshot brings you everything you want to know from the world of wheels as we take that break. Welcome back. Now I have to ask you, what do you make of this? What do you call such a boot? It's not a notchback, it's not a hatchback really. So what do you call that? Well, maybe you can come up with an interesting name for me. And uh, you know what, if it's a nice suggestion, we might make it official and push that name with Mahindra as well. On that note, let's also talk about another company that also likes to name its models a little bit differently depending on the kind of rear end styling it's thrown in on that car. So you get a sport back from Audi. And that's the kind of car we want to talk about right now because it is the A7, the quintessential sport pack. And uh, you know what? The car now has the more powerful S7 Avatar and we had the chance to test it for you. Bala was in Munich a few days ago with the car and here's our take on it. Sporty, sleek and very sexy. The Audi A7 show packed in all that. But then if added more groom to all that, you get the S7. The car retains the good looks of the A7, but does have some telltale changes to the exterior, like the badging on the front grille. But what will really catch your eye is the curved sporty hood and the quad exhaust, which gives the car its wonderful roll. Expect this to be in the Indian market very soon. They still haven't disclosed a launch date for this, but possibly by next year. Let's just see how peppy this one is. It didn't take too long for the adrenaline to kick in as we drove in the snow-filled countryside around Munich. That's largely due to the S7's twin-turbocharged 4-litre V8 engine. Put your foot down and hear the 420 horsepower engine come alive with a rather generous torque of 550 newton meters. Audi claims 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in just 4.7 seconds, with a top speed of 250 kilometers per hour. Audi has limited the car's top speed, but claims the S7 can be pushed to 285 kilometers per hour when the V8 engine is let loose. As we hit the Autobahn, the rush returns. The engine has minimal lag and offers an instant power boost. I'm just going to put my foot down the accelerator. Pretty much pulls me back with the kind of horsepower it generates. Really makes you say woohoo as you just press that foot down and you just drive on on the autobahn. 
and when you relax your foot on the pedal and choose to cruise, the S7 cylinder on-demand system allows you to drive with just four cylinders instead of all eight, making it less noisy and significantly more fuel efficient. The car has Quattro and also sports an adaptive air suspension which is an electronically controlled air suspension system which responds to real time to the surface requirement. Audi's servotronic speed dependent power steering is also standard. Inside you get all the toys including a Bose sound system. The S7 embossed leather sports seats add to the sporty appeal. So the S7 is for the affluent buyer who also wants sporty styling and turbocharged performance. With Audi's aggressive India market strategy paying off so far, expect the S7 launch sooner than later. Though we will get the S6 first. And so we reckon a festive season debut for the S7 may be on the cards. So should India get the S7 from Audi and has Mahindra priced the vibe just like you want it? Well, as always, I'll wait for your feedback and your comments on all these stories. Anything else you want to talk about? Hey, you know how to reach me, right? Twitter, Facebook, and of course, on NDTV Social as well. So while I wait for all of that feedback to come in and prepare something exciting for you next week, I will say goodbye. But please wear your seatbelts. Please wear your helmets. Drive safe. <laughs>